Hello, this is Darren Pulsifer, Chief Solution Architect of Public Sector at Intel, and welcome to Embracing Digital Transformation, where we investigate effective change leveraging people, process, and technology. On today's episode, bare metal software-defined infrastructure with Ian Evans and Mike Wagner from Metify. Ian, Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here. Hey, Ian, you're the CTO of Metify. Let's hear first from you. Uh, Give me a little bit about your background and um, how you got started. Sure. Uh, So I have actually uh, worked in the data center space for a very long time. I've probably been in it uh, since 1999. Um, And through that, I've worked in different roles, anywhere from uh, engineering roles up through systems architecture, um, and yeah, I just, I've focused on all the different domains, uh, storage network, uh, data center facilities. And, um, one of the things that, uh, I've learned over the years is how to optimize some of that infrastructure. And what we're really going to talk to you about today is, uh, what we've created, you know, something that really gets down into, uh, the data center, uh, deep into the data center and allows you to automate different aspects of it from servers to storage, uh, up through network devices and so forth. Hey, before we get started there, though, Mike, tell a little bit about your background and then why you hooked up with Ian here to start Metify. Yeah, sounds great. Um, so I started with uh, IBM many, many moons ago, um, and I was a network engineer. And uh, from there, I, I actually stayed with IBM for quite some time and shifted into direct sales. So working a lot with um uh, enterprise 1000, you know, top 1000 customers and uh, getting to a look inside their data centers, understanding the problems that they face, consultative selling, of course, uh, trying to understand the pains and what it takes to um, run and operate a data center and uh, do the things that you need to do to keep a company going and then to eventually use it as a competitive edge. Um, so that led me to going to Red Hat and um, I spent several years at Red Hat as well. And Red Hat introduced me to the channel side, which was really, really cool. Um, So I went from direct sales into really channel-led sales exclusively. Um, And like I said, that was really aperture opening for me and uh, a a fantastic experience. It was through that that I actually met Ian. Um, He was with uh, one of our top business partners, a very large multi-billion dollar organization. Um, and that led directly to solution development and the launching of Metify uh, three years ago. So that's what got me here. Wow, three years ago. So you guys have known each other for how long? Five, six, yeah. six yeah, years now? Five, yeah, five out of six years. Yeah. It's, yeah. Wow, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And, and you're still talking to each other. That's awesome. <laughs> <that's long. laughs> Because, yeah. hey, I've been in startups before. I've done three startups. And yeah, I don't talk to any of those founders. Oh, yeah. wow. <laughs> yeah, that's, not gonna that's, happen. A, that's a show onto its own. I look forward to having <laughs> yeah. that one. We'll have yeah, to. that'll be an interesting show. We'll have to do that one of these days. <laughs> you know, so what led you guys what, what led you guys to create <laughs> Metify? You, you talked about optimizing the data center. So there's a big elephant in the room, and it's called AWS, Azure, and GCP. Yeah. So if, if I'm going to be the devil's advocate here, I'm going to say, why in the world do I need to automate my own data center? Data centers are dead. Well, AWS comes and tells me that all the time. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think uh, it, it. I think it, there's there's a lot to that. Um, the automation piece of it is really around all the components in the data center is really the um, the big one. Um, right now, as it stands, you have all these different OEMs that you have to deal with within the data center. You know, different, um, you know, whether it's Supermicro, Dell, HPE. I mean, you go down the list, right? There's just a ton of different servers, a lot of different products, and each one kind of has its own specific manage, uh, management tool set uh, associated with it. And while there's a sta- there's uh, open standards coming together like Redfish, you know, where you can issue one specific command, it'll do something on all the servers, that's great. But you still have to fall back on a lot of those tools, you know, to manage full life cycle of those servers, right? So I think um, for, for us and, and where I really view it is um, if you're going to talk about the data center and you're going to build a successful infrastructure footprint that's fully automated, you need to be able to take a lot of those tools and bring them together, which then brings you closer to an experience that you would see in the public cloud. Where there's less emphasis on the underlying infrastructure, less focus on the individual pieces where you're, uh, you know, anywhere from a firmware update that you have to do on a server, which is time consuming. Sometimes that's still very much a manual process. 
All of that really needs to be wrapped into what I consider a single stream of automation. And then there needs to be something that uh, effectively, um, you know, kind of almost establishes like a single pane of glass over the, uh, over that entire thing. So, so, so you're cutting out because a lot of the complaints that people have and why they want to move to the cloud is speed yeah. um, and OPEX cost, mm -hmm. right? I can't yeah. find the right people. They cost too much, um, too much variability in my data center. And you guys yeah. have kind of, come in and said, hey, let's automate as much of that as we possibly can. We can run it more efficiently. And so you can compete, your own data center can compete with the cloud service providers on OPEX cost, for sure on OPEX cost, right? Yeah. Um, yeah that's... But your overall cost could actually be cheaper in a data center using a tool like what you guys have. Is that? Right, exactly. And that's that's a really important point because there's an absolute break-even point. I, I, what, I, what we loved about this space in particular getting getting very low was that first of all it, w it wasn't possible to do what we're doing six or seven years ago right i mean because open standards the, and the promise of open standards just became real essentially in the last five years um, the dmtf came out with the redfish specification the redfish specification uh ian bet on it early he saw the potential for it um wrote a thesis as soon as he showed it to me, I was like, holy moly, you were right. <laughs> this is beautiful. We can do something with this. Um, and um, and we just started working from that point. And with the ubiquity of the Redfish specification now across all motherboard manufacturers, um, all the motherboards that are going out at the, at the enterprise class have the BMC built into the board that adhered to the Redfish specification. All the players just got in line with it. Okay, so and this is so. Part why of, do you think? Yeah. Why do you think that is though that they finally got in line? Because red, the Redfish spec has been out for a long time. Yeah, five years, six years now. Yeah, so it just yeah. took. A, so, you know, I think it was led by the industry bigs. So HP and Dell are on the board of DMTF, um, and the guys there. So they had big champions to begin with. They recognized that there was a need to have this low level um, compatibility across multiple um, different hardware profiles to allow for. Uh, other tools to come in and, and do what they needed to do and integrate with the products in ways that they couldn't do if it was strictly proprietary. So, yeah. they, and they also saw ahead a bit on, on the white box side, right? Because the white box guys are coming in, providing this low level um, availability without all the expensive proprietary tools necessarily. So you don't want to get priced out of a game. Mm -hmm. So there was, uh, you know, financial pressures as well as open standards pressures from the users to allow them to do these things, self-service outside of you know expensive proprietary tools to always have to purchase and maintain in order to run these servers that they've already purchased, yeah. right? So yeah. lots of different you know pressures happening to make it all come together. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And I think I'll add a couple things to it. One is um, you know the good restful standard was still very much uh, absent. I mean, you you use tools like IPMI that was very common. Mm -hmm. yeah. Problem with IPMI is that um, you know, you have security concerns with it. Um, you know, when you start to deal with uh, things like the DMTF Redfish standard, you're actually full rest with that. So, you know, you're communicating in a secure manner. And once people start to see that there was actually a serious specification that had uh, a consortium backing it. There, like Mike mentioned, all the major OEMs are on board. You know, I think they started to take it much more seriously in, in terms of implementation and what they could do with it. And after they saw the capabilities and how extensible it was, being it was OData compliant, you know, there's all these things with, uh, that really enhanced the overall uh, capability of server management. That really helped uh, kind of seal the standard. I think it was just a, a matter of seeing some of the big guys go in on it, and then a lot of the other ones started to follow. And now you see it as, you know, kind of the common standard. Do, do you think there's some pressure on the OEMs um, to do this as well, to, to help improve data center efficiency on the mm -hmm. OPEX side yeah. so yeah. they can compete against the cloud service providers? Because Yes. Yeah. Right. I mean, I mean, ultimately, that's their biggest competition is AWS and Azure. Well, right? well as I mentioned, what they ultimately what, what it comes down to is everybody has their own tools. You know, a lot of people have their own automation frameworks, right? They want to be able to use those tools. They want to be able to integrate those with the standards. So you know, I think that, um, you, you know, really uh, helped quite a lot.
Um, so, you know, that's one thing. Mike, go ahead. I, I was just wanted to yeah. that in the beginning. No, for sure. I, I mean, you know, the, the pressures and, and, and the commoditization, right? The technology commoditization curve gets everybody eventually. So the hardware providers have been facing this for some time. So what do you do to differentiate? Well, sometimes it's, it's join the herd and make sure that you are, that you have, um, similar offerings in this case, more of a scaled down white box server that across the board now, HPE, Dell, uh, Supermicro kind of was the original like heavy in the space, yeah. right? Um, if, well, they're trying to take on the inspurs and the Quantas, they want to make sure they're not giving the market away to the hyperscalers. And um, especially at the tier two level, there's a number of opportunities with large enterprises that want some of the resi resiliency features in, in HP and Dell servers. They're fantastic servers. Um, but they also want to be able to automate and do the things that they the way they like doing them at a very at a low level. So what our tool allows them to do is for the first time have a single pane of glass that can heterogeneously provide lights out management across any manufacturer. And that's not just so server storage, networking, and really any device that's BMC enabled and adheres to the Redfish specification. So we've done some really cool stuff on the edge as well. Um, yeah. which is I was going to ask about, uh, about the edge because that's a huge concern that a lot of my customers and my listeners have is how do I manage the edge? Because yeah. it's highly heterogeneous. Mm -hmm. It's um, connectivity is questionable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and, but I still want to be able to push patches out like firmware patches mm -hmm. or BIOS patches out yeah. and, and do that in an effective way. So you, you guys provide kind of a, a common common management plane that as long as BM, you said as long as BMC and Redfish, yep. I can I can take a look at everything. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, we do. And and we even took it farther during COVID um, in in Ian's neighborhood, there were some teachers that were having trouble connecting to the internet and they because they had these new well i shouldn't they had broadband issues right so they're rural broadband users he lives in the blue ridge mountains beautiful granite range not exactly easy to get a signal through there um dense forest as well densely forested um so you know we saw an opportunity to help out the local community did that and you know we built another product um, that works really well with mojo platform and that's called photon um, as a photon router, and it's a it's a it's a proprietary. Uh, I mean, well, I should say it's a it's a very unique build. Ian has, has got a lot of um, skill in this area. He was a distinguished engineer at Verizon prior to joining, um, uh, by, prior to launching Metify, and um, he, a lot of a lot of skill and expertise in this space. And what he created was this rather amazing router that can do a hell of a lot with less from a bandwidth perspective. So, um, taking that you know sort of next step from core edge and then into the customer premise is where we've taken it all the way so to speak and it's all provisioned and maintained by mojo platform so so that's interesting because you brought up network yeah um do do network routers do they talk redfish as well can i manage well, at that lower level yeah so it's really interesting if you look at um you know uh, look in the sdn nfb space you look at some of the white box switches you know there is um, and merging standards to manage some of those devices through Redfish. Because at the end of the day, a lot of those are, you know, x86, 64 boxes or, you know, they have. Oh, well, yeah. 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 We yeah. hope they're using yeah. our, our chips. It's, exactly. Stuff. Right. <laughs> they so, are. So with that, there's really no reason why there can't be a BMC in there. It exposes some of that functionality. The question is, is how, how far does the extensibility get down into the networking specific you know, right. after, you know, stack, uh, parts of the stack. And, you know, you see Yang to Redfish, you know, where you can do things with, with Yang and NetComp, and that certainly lends itself to that. But you're also starting to see more native capabilities rolled in. So it's our hope, you know, as, as the Redfish standard does continue to emerge um, in networking devices, we start to see more coverage for what we consider just white box type of uh, switches. Yeah. So so I'm, I'm, I'm still wrapping my head around this whole thing. Yeah. Most organizations that I work with now, they have what I call a multi-hybrid cloud strategy. Yes. Where I have data center, I have edge, I have cloud. Mm -hmm. Yes. You guys don't work in the cloud, right? Because, well, you, the cloud doesn't let you guys manage their hardware. <laughs> right? <laughs> That's right. That would be a bad thing, right? Oh, yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna knock everyone off this one server so I can take control yeah. of it. Um, <laughs> But you guys can provide a a much 
a much more cloudish like um, experience from the operation side of things. Cool. Like my sysadmins, yeah. I can now go to one place and manage my edge, my data center, or multiple data centers. Yep. Um, yeah. All through all through a common API. Right. Uh, yeah. Common yeah. And that's great because you mentioned the API, and that's really the key is that we <laughs> we we make the product. Um, extensible in that way that the API is exposed. So if there is a set of automations, as an example, that do certain things in the public cloud, and there's some elasticity, or there's requirements where it needs to reach oh, back into the hybrid cloud or private data center, you know, we're working. Basically, customers are working both those APIs, and so those two systems are kind of working in tandem with each other to do certain things. So we see as long as we manage the API, we have the API exposed. You know, the customer can do certain things within that hybrid environment that certainly pertain to the private data center in, in uh, tandem with their public cloud deployments. Um, because of that API, does that mean you guys have integrations into um, management tools that people are already used to? Yeah, so it's it's a very common use case where we, we kind of the way we look at our the way we look at the APIs, we want to keep that as open and as standardized as possible. So if customers want to be able to take, you know, they have Terraform, they have Ansible, whatever they're using, so right, yeah. they can essentially use our API like they would any other API and they can build their own um, specific automation framework that works with a bunch of different things that Mojo might not even uh, manage. Um, so you know, that's that's been a huge focus for us is keeping that as accessible and open as we possibly can to facilitate exactly what you mentioned. All right, cool. Mike, I know you're etching, you're, you're itching, you're yeah. itching there to say something. So Well, so the, the hybrid experience, I mean, it is all hybrid. So when we talk about, you mentioned earlier, one of the first questions was public cloud growth. Everyone's saying the data center's dead. Uh, I mean, the fact is the growth in data centers in North America last year, 2022, 137% increase in megawatt usage okay a, a good percentage of that was hyperscalers but there is also a, a massive growth um, in the private cloud space so and this is this is an area that we we've always seen and it's been very consistent across the years yes the pu public cloud is growing the hyperscalers are growing faster but the growth of the enterprises is continuing it's not shrinking it's growing mm -hmm. so there is a, a moment when um, Companies recognize that their public cloud instantiations, that's a big bill. There's a, there's a specific price related to that ease of use and functionality, as well as being able to turn things on and off. So there, there's a break point. And from a OpEx perspective, um, it becomes much more efficient and palatable for a CFO to say, let's buy the equipment, write it off, and we know that we can use this well enough um, to do all the things that we needed to do. Okay, yeah. and, and you can watch that. You can watch that from a uh, price perspective. You know, save millions and millions of dollars a year, which which there's you know very public uh, examples of. Like Dropbox was a big one a couple of years ago. And this idea of cloud repatriation is mm -hmm. only picking up steam because you know the yeah I've, you guys I've, I've well speaking of you know uh, was it Graham Moore who just passed? You're the founder of yeah Gordon yeah, Gordon, Gordon Moore just passed yeah. Uh, last Friday. Yeah, so I mean he's been bang on about you know Moore's law. And you keep making better and better processors. You can do more with less and less. So what you can do now, and Ian loves talking about this, what you can do in a single rack now, mm -hmm. um, it used to be a couple rows, right? So the ability to bring in um, what you need to run the compute that you need is often much more uh, efficient than spinning up and dropping multiple cycles. And you get that uh, you know, uh, shadow IT thing under control as well. So there's a number of reasons from security to governance um, to, to costs that really drive this. Um, yeah. And, and to that point that Mike just made on the governance, um, <clears throat> that we see that as, you know, you can create whatever bare metal tools you want and you can have as much extensibility and as many systems support, whatever you need. If you don't have a good framework of governance and policy and security controls that are built around that, where basically the platform becomes the custodian of the hardware, and you're you're controlling things like what moves from staging to production. You know what can be overwritten. Who can do that? Who can place a specific workload on those machines? Who can uh, place firmware, but they can't do specific other things in the systems? These are all things that are critically important from the CXO's eyes, or you know somebody that is very much interested in the security posture of their data center. 
And since BMCs notoriously have a history of, you know, security vulnerabilities and things like that. Oh, yeah, really I was going to say. Yeah, there's yeah, a huge, they're wide open. huge um, level of um, oversight on that. So we, we see that as like critically important, has to be there. And that's where a huge focus on our products has been for, for controlling the data center. Yeah. All right. So this, uh, I'm glad you brought this up because this is an issue anytime you have an open standard, right? Um, if security wasn't thought about up front, and like you said with BMC, I don't really know who's logged in. I don't know really right. who's made those changes. Right. So you you guys have put uh, command and control together in in your platform. So I can have an auditability trail. Yeah. I know who has access to what uh, sets of machines or individual machines, whatever the case may be. Is that is that a true statement? It is. Uh, yeah. We've that. In fact, that was one of the areas we put a, a very a specific level of focus on very early in the product. Is that we we had to have that and. Um, the audibility trail, like you mentioned, be able to see what's happened over a period of time, who did what, you know, somebody bricks a couple of servers mistakenly. Well, this person or this well, group. I've never done that. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> So we, yeah. And then we also, you know, uh, on top of that, we also see importance around verification and validation checking for, for specific things that are done to infrastructure. So, you know, you don't have things like cascading failure. If something fails, you should have some logic in there that stops it from doing that again. So there's a lot of different things we see in that governance model, but yeah, that's that's really okay. Cool. So so I I can really see some real value here. Where before I'm like, okay, well you put a an interface in there, blah 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 blah. Everyone's got this, but you guys are actually treating this like a first class pro problem, right? A first class op operations thing, and you've exposed the dirty little secret that everyone has in data centers, yeah. right? Which is a, a handful of people hold the keys to all the kingdom. Right. Yeah. Right. They really do. The sysadmin, I'm doing patch updates. I'm doing all, I have complete control and access of the, of that machine. Right. Um, and you know, no one's watching me. Right. Yeah. And it, it is, you're right. That was a huge issue. It's been a longstanding issue and we address that. Um, and we, yeah, we, we offer level controls that, uh, not only prevent, you know, some, some of these the less desirable things from happening, but also the, you know, the auditing pieces of it and everything else that are critically important. So yeah. that, that that's that's pretty cool. Um, have you integrated with any any workflow management or tools that already exist out there, or you provide you know those types of workflows where I can actually do some automation workflows? Is that part of your tool, or do you rely on a tool above you to do that part? We do. We've got, so we, what we, we've done is there's a couple things that we focus on there. We mentioned one, I mentioned the API. So we bring your own tools. You know, we're very friendly towards that. We see that as very important. The other one is we do have workflows and automation built into the product. So customers that do have a very specific requirement, let's say they have a thousand servers across three different AZs and they want to make sure that they're only provisioning on systems that have this Xeon Gold 6244 processor with two Optane drives. And I'm talking up Intel here. That's right. <laughs> How about some persistent memory in there? Yeah, That's some right. persistent yeah. memory. Or some of our new Flex uh, GPUs. That's right. Yep. There. But you can, you can put those constraints-based profiles files in there and then you can mobilize a uh, service catalog item against that so as an example if they want to deploy openshift you know they can do that they can put those constraints in there those systems are then presented as the systems that would then be part of that automated workflow based on those specific constraints yeah pool. so that's pretty cool because i could yeah. span multiple oem vendors with yes that. yep in the eight that's it's and that is which is super cool. What you just mentioned, that's it. Um, that that is that is really the, right. the important thing for customers. They they don't want to be focused on all of these different OEMs all over the place, and they would really like to um, to to focus more on you know the, the capability of the systems, what it provides. You know, yeah. uh, not having to get into the proprietary tool yeah. required to create the pool of um, you know, hardware specific items that they need for a, a runtime, for a workload, for an OpenShift cluster, for an Anthos cluster, for a Rancher cluster, for a Tanzu cluster. We're, we work with all of them. We're partners with all those organizations. The guys at Major League Baseball and, and what we did for them specifically 
um, is was an edge based um, bare metal. I was going to say probably edge, right? right? Yeah, you absolutely. Got... So I, I mean that that build was a lot of fun for us, and you know it's a they're amazing customer. And what's cool is about Major League Baseball is they have this advanced media group that they publish uh, in a technical blog. Um, I think weekly uh, things that they're doing from a technical perspective because it's a really advanced group. They they were actually their own consulting house that Major League Baseball purchased. I'm assuming they must have been billing them and you know a lot. And they said, you know what, we just need to hire you guys. We're because, just going to hire you guys. Yeah. yeah. Well, and you know when you think about it, Major League Baseball was the they were the first ones that really got into this big data um, importance of having as much information. Well, that's yeah. right. Yeah. That's I mean, right. think about it, Moneyball, right? I mean, Moneyball, you know, the the, yeah, the, yeah. the, the, the true data. Uh, nuts that knew every possible detail about, you know, what a guy batted under, you know, duress, uh, how he uh, batted on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Friday. Where did he sleep last night? Exactly. At home or a hotel? It's all correlatable. I'm telling you. Did he sleep at home? Was, was he it a Holiday Inn Express? There we go. We had a better, better day. <laughs> There's data. There's data on it. So, I mean, so, they're the, so, but, yeah. but what were you guys helping major league baseball with? I mean, right. You said edge, is this in the stadiums? Is it, I mean, yeah. What, so what, yeah, yeah. So um, exactly that. So this is this is a perfect example of hybrid. Okay. So and this is Google was our partner as well, and uh, the the solution itself was every ballpark had to be refreshed with new hardware. And there's uh, because they are that's a high value target. Major League Baseball, you know, from a security perspective, had to make sure that everything was updated and all their security features were enabled. Um, so we provided a, an important layer to make that happen. Um, across any hardware profile for them. So um, specifically the build, um, I don't know if we can share, but it was, uh, yeah. so we'll just say that uh, the, the builds, yeah, the builds were, I believe it's five servers per ballpark um, across North America. And we, now we're working with their minor league parks as well. Uh, so that's expanded from the first year. We're in our, uh, I think our third year now with Major League Baseball. They, I mean, they started early with us. Um, and, so so with, with Major League Baseball then, yeah. If I have like five servers in each stadium, for example, yeah, I can I can sit at headquarters. I don't even know where headquarters is. Where yeah, is headquarters. In Major it's uh, well, so and I know so Kevin Backman is the uh, he's their senior principal. He's their senior architect who really spearheaded the the bare metal project. Um, and so along... he can sit in one place and manage all these stadiums. Yeah. Is that the idea? Yeah. That is super cool. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So they save money yeah, on you know cool. travel and expenses and flying around to you know have to do the thumb drive low level um, reboots to get an OS upgraded or or a firmware upgraded to specific firmware. So yeah, there's uh, just a ton of advantages to being able to remotely control low level infrastructure like that. So it's it's interesting because a lot of times when we talk about um, private cloud, we always talk about the software defined infrastructure layer as virtualizing everything mm -hmm. um and you guys don't do any virtualization at all <laughs> we but we you do. are doing yeah. software defined infrastructure yep yes for bare metal which to me yeah. is even more interesting it is because i can do a mix match of some bare metal yep. mm -hmm. some vms yes. some containers Yes, and you guys, you guys can manage the underlying infrastructure. That's right. Um, more effectively. Exactly. Um, yeah. 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 That's and, very cool. Go ahead. I mean, yeah, and so absolutely, and you know, we 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 love VMware. We work very well with VMware. Um, we all, we just also have um, we work well with everybody. I mean, just like you, um, Intel, we work at the chip level. And, you know, when you're as low level as, uh, as us, we get along with everybody because, frankly, we just want to make it really easy for you to access the chips and do what you need to do at that low level to provide, you know, the pooling and automation to take away the manual overhead that's required with a lot of this. Um, and once we, once we get that solid, once we get that sort of cloud-like experience to be truly frictionless, so you are, you know, able to discover, provision hundreds, thousands of nodes from a single location, um, either in a data center or through hybrid and into cloud, which is the cool part about what Major League Baseball does. And they publish this, like I mentioned, Kevin Backman, he published on in Medium. Uh, are you familiar with the um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Medium as well as their Major League Baseball blog? A really great article about how they did it. Bare metal to all the stadiums, you know, and he put some nice diagrams with um, Mojo Platform right at the right at the top of them. And I, 
So yeah. So 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 this is this is really interesting yeah. because I can see you guys as helping. Actually, uh, one big push that we have at Intel is what we call heterogeneous compute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, the CPU is a great general purpose uh, machine. It's mm -hmm. been around for 50, 60 years now. Yeah. And yeah. Amazing. It is. But we're starting to see different types of processors starting to emerge. Yeah. <laughs> like uh, visual processing units, neuromorphic processing units, yeah. GPUs, yes. all these things. PGA, yeah. You guys could easily let me manage this heterogeneous compute environment yep. Um, but, yeah um down at the chip level which is actually pretty cool yeah um yeah that's and, and, that and actually what's, exposes more yeah and what's exciting about that what you just mentioned is that it, you know with redfish it's great because it's it's an extension of the schema at that point you know so right yeah you need you need some additional functionality there's there's um standards board that, that reviews it they go through the process of um, extending that. And then next thing you know, you have some control there that you you have. And, and as long as the, the life cycle on the BMC and the firmware supports that functionality, you know, you can certainly go in and control those new devices. So we look forward yeah. to this the expanding ecosystem where it goes into, you know, the rack, PDU, it goes into server storage. I mean, Swordfish is another standard that we didn't really talk about, but, you know, that's, that's very much yeah. um, um, centric to obviously storage stuff. So... Yeah, we're following all that stuff very closely, and um, we see all those um, extensions as incredibly valuable as, as we move through the development of the product. Yeah, that's one of the best parts about community-driven innovation in general. Coming from Red Hat and seeing the power of open source, I mean, to have that open source community really driving the R&D, owning the R&D budget for us, and you know this broad community saying, okay, we absolutely know we need to add this into the Redfish specification. In, in, in the case of um, data centers, you know they're looking at power cooling um, all the way yeah. back to the plug, right? And you know those are we have a, we have a, um, a green data center um, solution that we're working with some crypto companies on, and um, it, it's just the way efficiencies are going to be driven um, today and and in the very near future. Um, it's just in its infancy, but it's all really being enabled through open standards. So everyone can you know, figure out how to work these things together, control them in ways that are um, AI driven, frankly, right? So you are um, powering up workloads at specific times, powering down. Yeah, I was going to say, depending on the Bitcoin price, I may mm -hmm. throttle back my power. <laughs> there you go, which is what which is what they do, right? So yeah, if, I'm if, sure they do. Yeah, yeah. no, if, if prices aren't right, the, the mining, the miners will just shut them off. Um, but yeah, there's there's no, ways. Yeah. Having that be automated is is actually pretty cool. Yeah. Or depending on price of is it a cloudy day or not? Do I have solar panels? All, I mean, yep. there's a lot of really cool things that you guys can actually help enable um, yeah which is uh, very, very and, and right right on that point darren is the chat gpt revolution right so <laughs> don't I, get me started on that i yeah. i don't know if you guys know this you, if you haven't you should go listen i interviewed chat gpt on this podcast well okay i did yeah. not hear that yet i can't wait <laughs> oh no you got to go listen yeah it's hilarious oh. um I mean, so yeah, I've and I work with Chat GPT quite a bit as an augment as an augmenter to the work that I do. Um, sure. Very cool. Yeah, I, great, great stuff. And when you look at what they're doing and the specialization that's involved in the workloads, right? The compute intensive specialization that Chat GPT requires, right? Uh, with these new chips and and the new frameworks that are being built around it. So this is just center of the bullseye for us, right? So we're um, I don't know how much we could talk about it right now. Well, we're 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 looking at a, a hosted offering, frankly, um, in this space to provide specialized um, bare metal uh, workload optimization across this, specifically for chat GPT type startups that are looking to it's quickly oh, that's, scale. That's super cool. Their infrastructure, right? So, I mean, it, and these are the things, these are the barriers of entry, right? There could be some great ideas that are out there from a chat GPT or other, you know, GPU heavy or one of these new chip heavy, um, workload perspectives that we can quickly get up and running. And it's very easy for us to spin up um, any of these workloads because again, we operate at the chip level and uh, whatever the peripherals are that need to be added into the box to make it um, uh, optimized to run specific workloads, we can easily do that. So it's something that we're, we're kicking around and we certainly see uh, potential for. And given 
and given this this very interesting moment <clears throat> with uh, chat gpt and the potential for it not to mention the investment in this space there's just oh, going to yeah. be a need for infrastructure specialized infrastructure that we are confident we uh, we know how to deliver well and, and possibly <coughs> excuse me mm. possibly specialized infrastructure that spread across the edge that's right that's right because right? i don't necessarily want to move all that data right. from the edge back into a data center and in some cases, we're, I'm starting to see some really cool data architectures mm -hmm. where there is no center. There is no yeah. data center. It's yeah. federated across a, 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 an edge yeah. that uh, yep. no one's in control of. And, and that in fast. that per box power now, you know, what you can put into one, how many cores you can put into one processor, you know, and just the, the you know, PC, new PCIe advancements, you know, all these things, NVMe, it just, you, it, it's amazing what you can put into a small box. So yes, we, that, point there and we totally recognize that and, and it's that's absolutely true yeah so hey guys this has been wonderful um any last words for our listeners uh today anything you want to share oh boy no i think uh, we seem to cover quite a few bases there no pun intended so if they want to find out more it's metify.io correct m-e-t-i-f-e-y dot i-o uh, to find out more about uh, your company and the products that you offer right that's it yeah all right cool thanks thanks guys for coming on today thank you darren thank you very much darren. thank you for listening to embracing digital transformation today if you enjoyed our podcast give it five stars on your favorite podcasting site or youtube channel you can find out more information about embracing digital transformation at embracing digital.org until next time go out and do something wonderful